first year. How many of you are here for the first time? Excellent, welcome, sister. And <laughs> All right, tonight we are um, going to study Parsha Toldot. Can you say Toldot with me? And Toldot means generations. And it's going to stay from Genesis 25, verse 19, all the way through Genesis 28, verse 9. I've entitled this year, The Never-Ending Battle for Truth. And this whole teach tonight is going to be speaking about finding the truth. And we're, we're, we're going to do some comparisons between the blessing that, I, that Isaac gave to Jacob, and, and we'll compare that to the, the, the blessing that was stolen in the Garden of Eden. There are very, many similarities between Jacob receiving the blessing and the serpent tricking the, um, Eve, and Eve also causing Adam to partake. So um, I, I don't know how many of you are, are Trekkies or have seen Star Trek over the years. Um, I became a fan of the the second series of Star Trek called The Next Generation. And if you've seen the opening, if you heard the opening script, it goes, Planet, space, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. And some of you have it memorized, you can say it along with me. It's continuing mission to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations, to boldly go where no one has come before. Now, if I were to rewrite that script for Destin Fatora, I would call it the final generation. And it would go like this, living the Torah portions. These are the voyages of destined for Torah. That's all of you. It's continuing mission to spread Torah to strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations, to transform one's character, to fulfill one's mission in life, and to boldly go where no one has gone before. And that's what Torah does for you. Awesome. Torah will cause you to be transformed. Torah will help you to overcome character flaws. <coughs> Torah will help you to overcome negative dispositions. Torah will help you to, to overcome struggles in life. There can be struggles of poverty. There can be struggles in, in relationally. There can be struggles in marriage. Struggles in your career. Struggles in your, in your education. Just struggles just from things that have gone on through your bloodline over the generations. The Torah will help you come out of a state of poverty, and poverty is not just financial. There are many areas of poverty, financial, spiritual, emotional. There are so many aspects of poverty, but it's, it's the Word of God that will bring you out of a state of, 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 of depravity and bring you, into a, in, bring you into an exalted state. Amen? Amen? And that means sometimes I'll even use something as secular as Star Trek and elevate it to a core level. Amen? And I don't know how many of you heard, but Reverend Gregory actually played the Star Trek theme. It's a little bit late, but he did it. So tonight, uh, you know, so you, you know, I was a fan of Star Trek The Next Generation. Bob and I had suffered through this for many years. <laughs> uh, uh, it's true. It's true. It is. Yeah. yeah, I haven't watched since last night, so torture. So tonight, <laughs> <laughs> so tonight we're going to talk about Star Trek The Next Generation. But, uh, um, you know, seriously, tonight we're going to speak about generations. Can you say generations? Generations. And this Parsha, this Torah portion, is Parsha Toldot. Tor, uh, toldot means generations. I'm going to ask, actually, before I ask you to turn to script, I want to share the word generations and the word image or likeness of God through several scriptures before we get to tonight's Parsha. Because you need to understand generations going back to the earliest scripture in the Bible. Dr. Krell has taught us a concept called uh, Gezra Shabbat. Can you say Gezra Shabbat? Gezra Shabbat. And Gezra Shabbat means an equivalent of expressions. Or, so, if I can just simplify it for you all, it means if you ever see the same phrase or the same words repeated multiple times, well, guess what? You have a Gezra Shabbat. And if you see the same words repeated multiple times, then most likely there is there's a simil there's something to be gleaned by the repetition of words. Now, to make your study of the Bible more exciting and to, to make it more help you to get more out of it, you need to understand the author's intent. And you need to know who the author of, of the first five books of the Bible is. Who is the author of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy? Moshe or Moses, as we say in English. So, Moses, who, who wrote the first five books of the Bible, you'll notice the same themes, the same concepts, repeating over and over and over again. And Moses using the word generations over and over again, it means that those words or those verses are linked together. So before I talk about generations, because I, I, I believe generations is tied to the image of God. Genesis 1.27, and God created man in his image. 
in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Genesis chapter 5, verse 1 and 3. This is the narrative of the generations of man. On the day that God created man, in the likeness of God, he created him. So man is created in God's image. And then Genesis 5 tells us about the generations of man. Then if you go to the days of the flood, Genesis 6, 9, it says these are the generations of Noah. Then we continue on to Genesis 37, verses 2 and 3. These are the generations of Jacob, which we'll study about in the next few weeks. These are the generations of Jacob when Joseph was 17 years old. It doesn't look like those two phrases go together, but they are linked together. So Joseph is connected to Jacob. Jacob is connected to generations. Mm -hmm. Noah is connected to generations. Adam is connected to generations. And the generations also corresponds to the image of God being formed inside of you. Amen? Amen. We need to look at image of God not just in the past tense when God created Adam and Eve. We need to look at generation. We need to look at God's image in us as something that's in the continuous present tense. That means you are every single day, every single moment, especially tonight as you're in Torah study, as you're studying the Word of God with me, what's taking place with all of us is that the image of God is being formed within, within us. If you believe that, please say amen. amen. The image of God is being formed in us. And Genesis 25, 9. This is where the Parsha, Parsha told Dorf begins. I'm going to ask you to say this several times because I want you to have this memorized. Can you say Parsha told Dorf? Translated into English as the Torah portion of generations. Again, from Genesis 25, 19 to 28, 9. Toldot can mean offspring. It can mean generations. I'm going to use the word generations for tonight's teaching. Because the word when you think about the word generations or generate, what comes to your mind? Mm. Perfect, Gregory? A creating. Creating. Something yeah. that comes from nothing mm -hmm. and begins and continues. Exactly. And this is something that's continuing. Amen? The, the entire Bible from Genesis through Revelation is just God's continual process of working in the creation. Amen? God never ceases to work. God never sleeps. He's always working until we all come into the fullness of Christ Jesus within each and every one of us. So, in a general sense, Toldot represents something that one generates or produces. And this Torah portion tells us about the generations of Isaac. And it's a, it's a strange wording here. It says, these are the generations of Isaac, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac. So it's a rather strange flow, isn't it? So, you know, what are we talking about here? One thing that we realize, we see that we, we only see Isaac being mentioned here. We don't see Ishmael mentioned. We don't see any of other any of Abraham's other children mentioned. And Abraham had many sons, but the only one that's mentioned here is Isaac. These are these are the generations of Isaac. Then it says then it ends with Abraham begat Isaac. And what this tells us, only Isaac was found worthy to carry on the Abrahamic covenant. Only Isaac was found worthy to carry on the Torah, to carry on the Word of God. Because Abraham converted to monotheism, I believe, according to rabbinic uh, Midrashic commentary, I think, I believe, he, I believe he was in his 40s. And at age, was at age 75, he was called to leave his father's house. So, so that Abraham was converted, and, and, he, and he passed 10 tests that God set before him, and he served God fully. He was the patriarch of Hesed. Do you say Hesed? Hesed. Hesed means loving kindness. And he carried, he was the embodiment of the character trait of Hesed to the highest degree. I don't believe any person since has carried Hesed the way Abraham carried Hesed. And, and we learned that only Isaac was found worthy. He was the only worthy successor of the Abrahamic covenant. And within the generations is the never-ending battle for truth. That's tonight's teaching title. The never ending battle for truth. And that and that is what and, and that that's what Jacob was the bottom of was. He was the patriarch of truth. Isaac was the patriarch of starts with a G. Gaborah, which is God's strength. It also represents discipline. 
And then the twelve daughter of Isaac, Isaac begat two sons. Who were his two sons? Esau and Jacob. The, the twins. Jacob the younger, Esau the elder. And again we see the, the generations of Isaac, the son of Abraham. Abraham fathered Jacob. In a spiritual sense, only Isaac was the son of, of Abraham. So we don't, in this entire total, in this, this entire Parsha, we don't read about Ishmael, we don't read about the other sons of Abraham, we only read, we, we, we learn about Esau, and we learn about Jacob. And Abraham was the first man to seek God, and he's the father of all convert, converts. We don't see any conversions taking place in the generation of Noah. The very time, the very first time that we see conversion taking place began in the days of Abraham and Sarah. Because Abraham had this unbelievable longing to, to bring the revelation of God's name to the masses. I mean, he, he, he was converting the men. His wife, Sarai, was converting the women. And, and Sarah was teaching the women. Abraham was teaching the men. So this is the very first time that we see conversion taking place. But he had a genuine love for God, had a genuine love for people. I mean, he was, I mean, he was, I would, I would really, I would call him the first evangelist. Again, Isaac is the patriarch, patriarch of Geborah. Can you say Geborah? Geborah. Or strength, or the awe of God, or self-discipline. Jacob is the patriarch of Tiferet. Can you say Tiferet? Tiferet. Tiferet means truth, or it can mean beauty. Now I'm going to go to the next verse, verse 20. And um, I'll read this to you from, I, I believe I have a different translation here. Uh, but uh, the question I'm going to ask you all is, whose prayers were more powerful? Isaac's prayer or Rebecca's prayer? And, and, and in order to answer this question, you need to understand the background of Isaac and Jacob. So Genesis 25, 20 says, And Jacob was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Aramean, to himself for a wife. Then verse 21 reads, And Isaac prayed to the Lord opposite his wife, because she was barren. And the Lord accepted his prayer, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. So she was barren, and every one of the matriarchs was barren. Sarai was barren for many years. She did not conceive, she did not give birth to Isaac until she was 90 years old. Rebekah was barren, she did not, she did not give birth for 20 years. I mean, they, they married, he was 40 years old when they got married, and Isaac and I'm sorry, Esau and Jacob were not born until Isaac was 60. I don't know how, how old Rebecca was. And then we read about um, Leah and Rachel, they were both barren as well. And, then, and that's a question I want to ask you all, or I want you to ponder, why did God allow the matriarchs to be barren? And I want you to relate this to your own destiny and your own calling in life. I think most of us can say that nothing that God gives us comes easily to us. Everything comes through with much struggle. And finding the truth in your life doesn't come overnight. It takes many years of toiling and prayer and fasting and seeking God and, and study before you find out what God's will for your life is. Amen? So, here, 20 years, the couple is childless. And Isaac prayed to God opposite his wife because she was barren. And God accepted his prayer, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. Now, where did Isaac go to pray? It's the very same place where Abraham was about to offer him as a sacrifice. It was Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah was Isaac's place of prayer. And that's the very place that he went to to intercede for his wife. And then the question I want to ask you again is, whose prayers were ranked higher? Yitzhak or Rivka? Yitzhak is Hebrew for Isaac. Rivka is Hebrew for Rivka. I want to teach you the Hebrew names as well. Can you say Yitzhak with me? Yitzhak. Excellent. And then Rivka? Rivka. What I'm going to think what I'll do for next week, and I'll, I'll need Rev, Rev. Gregory's help, is we'll, we'll bring the whiteboard in here, and then I'll ask him to write down some of the words that we're using. We don't have a projector here, but I think if we write some of the words down, yeah. it'll, it'll help you along. We, we can also show that on Facebook Live as well. So, Rebecca, okay, how many of you, I'm just asking the question before the teaching. How many of you think 
that Rivka's prayers rank higher than her husband Yitzhak. Raise your hand. Raise them really high so I can see. So I don't have to guess. And I'm going to ask Auntie Marilyn if you'll do a count for me, please. <laughs> I think we're going to have a bunch of no votes tonight. All right, how many of you think that Isaac or Yitzhak's prayers rank higher? Five? Five? So five. So, no votes. So, so, so we got more, more votes for Isaac and a bunch of no votes. I hope you all voted on Tuesday. I, I, hope, you all, I hope you all voted on Tuesday. And I won't, I won't do a poll here, because I may not like the answer. So, um, so it depends on who you ask. Some rabbis say that Rivka's prayers were, were ranked higher, and, and others will say that uh, the, the other's prayers were ranked higher. So according to uh, some teachings from Hazal, Hazal's rabbinic authority, some from Hazal say that the prayers of a repentance are ranked higher than the Zadikim. Let me translate that to English. The prayers of those that have come out of uh, uh, idol worship, have come out of a place of, uh, of where they've had to perform extreme repentance or extreme turnaround, their prayers are honored more than the, than the prayers of the righteous. So Abraham gave, you know, then comes Isaac. So Isaac has known nothing but godliness his entire life. He never left the parameters of the Holy Land. He never wasn't allowed to let, let, let leave. That's why Abraham had to send, send Eliezer, his servant, to find a wife for his son Isaac, because he, he was not permitted to leave the boundaries of the Holy Land. And you look at Jesus' ministry, with the exception of the time that he, they had to escape to Egypt, it, Jesus never left the confines of the Holy Land. And his ministry was to the lost, lost sheep of Israel. Amen? It wasn't until the apostles, and specifically Paul, that evangelization, evangeliz evangelization occurred, occurred, well, occurred to the Gentiles. But Christ's ministry was to the, to, the, to the Jews. The ministry of the disciples was to the Jews. Amen? And we read a very few instances where, where we see conversions among the Gentiles. So, Rebecca, so some uh, rabbis say that Rebecca's prayers rank higher. And, and I and I do believe that in the sense because, she, I mean, she came from the most idolatrous house. And what was even worse than that was her. she came from a bloodline where there was no character. I mean, her brother, I mean, can you imagine being, uh, being the brother, uh, being the sister? Because her brother Laban was known as the most, he was known as the greatest sorcerer of the Middle East. He was known as one of the wickedest, one of the, probably the most wicked man one of the most wicked people of his generation, who was just con who was consumed by greed. And when Eliezer came and he put he gave gold and he put gold in, upon Rebecca, what did Eliezer, I mean, what did Laban look for? The gold. All he cared about was, was material wealth. Nothing wrong with material wealth, but he lusted after it. There was no character in, at all in him. There was no character with his father, no character with a mother. It was it was a complete it was a completely depraved bloodline. But even in the midst of that, what we find a jewel, and that was Rebecca, a completely righteous girl. And she was the one God chose to become a matriarch of the Abrahamic, uh, Abrahamic dynasty. So, uh, so one opinion is that Rebecca's prayers were ranked higher because God puts higher value on one that repents than, than one that is already righteous. And I agree with the opinion of Hazal that it is, I mean, there's something about the prayers of those that are completely repentant. And I believe God honors the prayers that are more dependent. Amen? Because Isaac did not have that disposition. Isaac grew up in a home that, was, that, that, that served God fully. I mean, can you imagine living in the household of Abraham and Sarah? I mean, surrounded by God's presence all the time. A righteous household. And, Rebe and Rebecca was raised in an atmosphere of just horrible horrible character traits. Just full of character flaws. But out of it came Rebecca. So that's one opinion. Now let's look at the other opinion, because when we study Torah, we're going to give you different, even conflicting opinions. 
Let's look at Isaac. How many of you, again, say that Isaac's prayers were ranked higher than Rebecca's? One, two, three, four. Okay, excellent. I think we have five people left. So Isaac, uh, the Rashi says that Hashem, the Lord, listened to Isaac's prayers over Re Rebecca's prayers because one cannot compare the prayers of a righteous son uh, or the, the son of a righteous parent to the prayers of a daughter of evil lineage. So that's another opinion. Another opinion given about supporting Isaac was Isaac worked very hard to create his own path to serving God. See, even though Isaac was the son of Abraham and Isaac and he had a great, a great path laid before him, Isaac did not depend upon Abraham's greatness. Isaac strove to develop his own relationship with God. He couldn't say, well, I'm Abraham's son. I'm Abraham's son. You know, when the, when the Pharisees said that to Jesus, what did Jesus say? Out of these stones, I can raise, raise up sons to, to Abraham. So we can't depend, we can't say because of my parents, I, I'm this great. Because every one of us has to work out our, our, our own salvation with fear and tremble. Amen? So Isaac, Isaac worked on his character. Isaac worked on his prayer life. Isaac worked on, 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 on every one of his character flaws. Because every, everyone has character flaws. And he worked very hard to build his own identity in his relationship with God. And so Isaac became the patriarch of Gevorah, of God's strength, of God's Gevorah, of self-discipline. Whereas his father was the patriarch of Hesed, of loving kindness. I'm going to repeat this over and over again because you need to, because we all need to really have, have the foundation down where Abraham is the patriarch of loving kindness, or Hesed. Isaac is the patriarch of Gevorah, of self-discipline or strength, and or or the or the awe of, or fear of God, and Jacob is the patriarch of Tiferes. And I'll and I'll, I'll add these things to the blog as well. Uh, I've I've been adding notes in the weekly blogs. Uh, so if you go to destinedfortorah.com, destin the number four, the word Torah. If uh, if someone's online on Facebook Live, uh, if you wouldn't mind if you just write that down so everyone knows that website www.destinedfortorah.com and just go click on blogs and, and scroll down to tonight's teaching. And I'll have all that notes probably tomorrow afternoon. So it, Isaac really worked on discipline. Isaac truly worked on serving God to the highest degree. And, and God developed the gift of Gavora inside of him. And each and every one of us, in, in our walk with God, through our testings, through all the trials that we go through, we only need to find out what our primary character trait is. When I look around, I know, I know many of you in this room, and some of you uh, excel in Gevorah. Others of you excel in Hesed. And not, but no two of you are identical, because you all have different blends of various <coughs> character traits. Amen? Amen? And character is everything. Rebecca Marilyn. Yes, um, I'm thinking it was Isaac because Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife and entreated means persistent and insistent in prayer and just the meaning of his name yes. that he had the strength to pray it through. So you changed your opinion since Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> this afternoon, Rebecca Marilyn said Rebecca, and now she said Isaac, and she and she was able to defend it with scripture. And I've been going back and forth. I, I don't have uh, well, I may have an opinion by the end of the service, but I'm going to share both opinions with you all tonight. So, whose prayers were ranked higher? I believe both prayers were necessary. Yeah. I don't believe Jacob and Esau would have been conceived without both of their prayers. But I would agree with Marilyn in the sense that maybe Isaac's prayers um, rank a little, a little bit higher. Pastor, can I do a small little rebuttal on that? Sure. Uh, uh, <laughs> to answer, sister. Um, I'm reading the narrative, and if you read the narrative uh, in, um, in 22, in 21, it says, I actually pleaded, right? And, and the Lord granted this plea. But if you read the narrative uh, on verse 21, it says that, uh, that uh, in 20, that uh, she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, 
So she actually had a conversation with God. Let's not, let's, let's hold on that. Sorry. Yeah. So, so that, I just wanted to put that in. Okay. So God actually talked to her. <laughs> Pastor Michael, that was... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Pastor Michael. That was awesome. Let's give him a hand. No, no, I'm, <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. So we could actually have a debate tonight in the chamber, but it's in the room. Pastor Michael. We could do that next week if you like. Okay, okay. Sorry. That, that actually would be really good, too. It, 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 each one could take a different argument, a different point, and argue that point, but not argue in the sense of arguing, but in, in terms of research and, and, and backing up your opinion with, with, with scripture and with rabbinic commentary. Now, let's talk about prayer for a second. A person should never be satisfied with the level they've achieved in God. So I don't, I don't want any of you ever saying, I've arrived and this is where I'm, this is where I'm to be, and that that's all there is. Because we need to, our entire lives should be a, a life of striving to draw closer to God. To become more intimate with Him. To become more like Him. To be formed more in the image of Him. Amen? Amen. And that was, that, that's what Isaac did his entire life. I believe until the time he died. He strove for a, he strove for a deeper relationship with God. And Jacob did the same thing. Esau, in contrast, did the exact opposite. So we should never be satisfied with the heights we have achieved. Amen. And some, some of us only see prayer as simply a means of procuring our needs. So we only pray when we need something. I've met so many folks that only run or call a pastor or show up at a service when they have a need. But when, things, when their needs are met, you never see them. And the next time you see them, maybe a year or two later, when they have a need. But that should not be our walk with God. I'm, I mean, we should, our walk with God should not be a selfish walk. And when your needs are met, you should be helping other people as well that are in need. Amen? Amen. Because we're here to support one another. There's not one of us that has everything together. There's not one of us that has a perfect financial picture. Not one of us has everything that's right. So we all need to support one another. Amen? Amen. Amen. And... Another concept I want to teach you is about Isaac. Is Isaac felt his wife's pain so strongly that he prayed for her with great depth and passion. When, and when we look at Jesus in the garden, he prayed with such passion that even his sweat became great drops of blood. How many of us have learned how to pray with passion? You know, to, to what really where we're just on our faces before God. How many of us really went to intercession for, for, for what took place last night in Thousand Oaks? With over 13 people dead, he says, including the sheriff. I mean, this, this happened here in Southern California. And some of our friends are impacted by what took place. And I offer up tonight's cheer for, 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 all, for all the families that are suffering right now. Yeah. I mean, I mean, just, yeah. just a, a pointless shooting taking place in a bar in Thousand Oaks, and 13 are dead right now. And I, I mean, how many of us have really gone into intercession and allow the Holy Spirit to pray through us and to really just intercede and to pray for protection? Amen. Because my fear is that this bloodshed in Southern California is going to increase. And this wasn't an act of terrorism. So we can't blame terrorism on these acts. But we're, we're seeing more and more and more of this happening in America. And I, my, my request is that all of us come into a place of prayer and go ask the Lord for his protection to fall upon the land. Amen. His protection. Amen. Amen. It's a total miracle that 9-11 has not occurred a second time in the United States. Yes. It's a total miracle. Yes. It should have happened several times mm -hmm. since. Mm -hmm. But I believe it's because of prayer that it, it has not happened a second Amen. time. Amen. And it's my prayer that it will never happen again. Amen. But I pray for peace in America. Amen. I pray for peace in Jerusalem. There's something that when you pray for the peace of Jerusalem, that God will bring his shalom, his peace to you. Amen. Amen. You know, I was in prayer this afternoon, and there was a lady sitting near me in the chapel, and she's wearing this, uh, this, he this head shawl, and I'm written on it was Jerusalem. And I, and I couldn't help but look, stare at, those at the word, and the middle letters of Jerusalem are USA. And I go, Lord, I don't believe that's coincidence. And especially when the Lord shows that to me while I'm in, while I'm communing with Him, yeah. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in prayer. I'm in prayer at, at a certain place, and I go, 
Lord, this is a very special place for the United States in, in biblical history. And I believe God raised up the United States to be a protector, to be a young lion that will be a protector for the nation of Israel. Amen? Amen. Amen. And I, uh, so I encourage you all, because I, 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 there's such an anti-Semitic spirit coming into this country. And my prayer is that we all love the Jewish people. Christians do not replace the Jews. I am not, I, I am not Jewish. I, I, I'm a Christian believer that loves the Torah. I love the Torah. I love the Jewish people. And, I, and I'm humbled to be able to teach Torah because I'm not worthy to teach Torah, but I, I believe I'm grafted in because of Yeshua, Amen. because of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Jesus Amen. is Jewish. Amen. All the disciples Hallelujah. were Jewish. Paul, the apostle, the, the apostle to the Gentiles was Jewish as well. Yes. Amen. And I consider it a tremendous privilege and an honor to stand before you and teach his word. Amen. Amen. See, Paul did not convert the Gentiles to Judaism. In fact, Paul did not teach the, 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 um, Christ, the Gentile believers to, to, to perform 613 commandments. He only instructed them to keep the seven Noahide laws. Amen. And that's my instruction as well, that we fulfill the seven Noahide laws. Amen? Amen. So, I encourage you that every one of you develop a prayer life. And a prayer life in which you allow the Holy Spirit to pray through you with groans that cannot be uttered. And allow the Holy Spirit to pray His burdens through you. Amen. There's a type of prayer where when someone says, uh, someone comes up to you and say, well, um, you know, um, let's say Mother Aida, and you pray for me. And let's say she just, okay, I'll pray for you. And she'll say a quick prayer and do her own thing. But then there's another type of prayer where I come to Mother Aida and say, Mother Aida, can you pray for me? Uh, we have this situation it, that it was was something, and what happens? She goes into a deep groaning, into a deep intercession, and she may break out into tears. You know why? Because she starts feeling my pain so strongly that she breaks forth in intercession. Amen. Amen. I encourage every one of you to read a certain book. This book is called Reese Howell Intercessor. That is the most out of all the Christian books I've read in my entire life, that book, that single book, besides the Bible, of course, this book had a, has, has had a bigger impact on my life than any other Christian book. Reese Howe, Intercessor. And through this book, you will learn how to carry the burden of others. For example, the Spirit of God led him to intercede for the widows in India. And the widows were, were not being taken care of through a social security system. So God put him on a fast where he only ate, I think he ate one bowl of rice per day, I believe. I don't remember exactly is that, is that mm -hmm. what happened. And so he lived like the widows in India. And he continued on this fast until the laws in India changed, which provided social security for the widows. And, and he, I mean, the Spirit of God put the burden upon him. A guy in America carrying the burden for widows in, in, in a country halfway around the world. Mm -hmm. So the Spirit of God will put that burden upon you. Dr. Kral is leaving for Uganda in, I uh, believe, the second week of January. You know, it's one thing to say, um, Dr. Kral, have a great time, have a wonderful mission, we'll see you in a week. That's one thing. But the better thing to do is allow the Spirit of God to put that burden upon you to where you can enter into an intercession. So she's going through, a, let's say she's going through a very difficult time, maybe stuck with customs, given, uh, being harassed by officials because they, they, they won't release the medications. And you don't need a text message or a phone call. This, you, you're so sensitive to the Holy Spirit that the, bur the burden of the Spirit of God will come upon you and you will enter into deep intercession. Amen. And that's, amen. And that's amen. exactly where Isaac entered. I want this Torah class to become so applicable in your lives. I don't want to teach you a beautiful teaching and say this is wonderful. I want you to be transformed when you leave here. Amen. And I want the, I'm asking the Holy Spirit tonight. And Holy Spirit, I ask you this yes, evening Lord. that the same burden you placed upon Isaac, Amen. that you will bring upon us to intercede for somebody else's needs. Amen. There's, a, there's a writing in the Gemara that says, One who prays for another and is in need of the same request, he is answered sooner. So if you have a need for something, pray for somebody else that has that same need. If you're believing God for a child, 
and you can't conceive, well, pray for somebody else that, 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 has that, that has the same need. And often you'll find God will answer your request sooner. And every one of us has different battles in life. I'm going to call them battle points. So every time you walk, as you're walking with God, you know, let's say there may be one person that, that may be a, a habitual liar. He just repeats those lies over and over again because that's part of his evil disposition. So that person has to work on overcoming the lying habits until he's no longer controlled by them. But once you overcome that one battle, well, guess what? You've gained territory in that area in your character. Now you're going to fight another area in your character. Amen? And when God promotes you, you're going to be faced with different temptations. Let's say, for example, you're, you're, you're pastoring a small group. And, and you're given a certain uh, field of responsibility. And you, your prayer life is great and, and everything's in balance. Then what happens, God promote, promotes you and gives you a, a gigantic congregation and gives you all these responsibilities. Well, guess what your temptation then is? You don't have time to pray any longer because you're so busy doing stuff. Well, guess what? That's your next battle point. So throughout your journey in life, you're going to find out you're going to have different temptations, different weaknesses that you're going to encounter. So I encourage every one of you, don't, don't forsake prayer, don't forsake the Word of God, and don't forsake the fellowship with one another, because we need each other to get through every single battle point. Amen? Because yeah. one of the purposes of creation is that we exercise our free will and use it to elevate ourselves to greater levels. Because we need to move from glory to glory to glory to glory. Amen? Amen. Now let's talk about the struggle in the womb. Let's turn to Genesis 25, verse 22. I'm going to ask Dr. Vicki to come up, for, uh, come up, please. Genesis 25, 22. We're going to spend quite a while in this verse here. And the children struggled within her, and she said, If it be so, why am I like this? And she went to inquire of the Lord. Excellent. Thank you, sister. So the, ch the children, she's pregnant now. God answered their prayers. I believe it's because of both of their prayers, Isaac and Rebecca, that God heeded their prayers. Because God was pulling both of them into prayer. But I, I would agree that maybe Isaac's prayers ranked a little bit higher than Rebecca. So, and she's asking the question, because the, the, the twins are fighting in the womb. There's a struggle taking place. And she's asking the question, why am I thus? You know, she didn't get a, a, a sonar, uh, what do you call it, a sonar brain? Mm -hmm. so, 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 but there's something going on in her womb. She doesn't know what's going on. And so she went to inquire of the Lord. Now, let's talk about the struggle. Rebecca was pregnant with twins. And these children, Isaac and, and I'm sorry, Esau and Jacob, their struggle began in the womb. The struggle did not begin when Isaac, when Jacob was 40 years old or whatever. The struggle began in the womb. And guess what? The struggle has not stopped. The struggle will continue until Messiah returns. Esau's hatred for Jacob began in the womb. And it, can you imagine a hatred so intense that it began in the womb of Rebekah? And I want you to imagine this. I want you to picture this. On the right-hand side, my right-hand side, probably your, right, your left-hand side, on my right-hand side, that's Mount Moriah. And upon Mount, Mar upon Mount Moriah are, are, is the houses of the house of Torah study, of the son and grandson of, um, of Noah. Um, of, yeah, of Noah. Then on my left-hand side is the houses of idolatry. Now here's Rebecca walking. She leaves her home and she's walking her way all the way to Mount Moriah. But she has to pass by the houses of idol study first. So as she's walking past the, the, the places of idolatry, guess what takes place? Esau becomes agitated, and Esau struggles to come out of the womb. Wow. And, as, and then it, she continues walking, and now she comes to Mount Moriah, the houses of Torah study, guess what takes place? The opposite. Now Jacob is, is striving to come out of the womb. And the struggle began in the womb of Rebekah. The houses of Torah study were, no, were 
headed by Noah's son Shem and Shem's grandson Eber. So it was, it was Noah's great grandson. And the, the, the house of Torah study was at Mount Moriah. This is the very same place that Jacob had gone to later on in life when he went to study Torah after he fled from Esau. He went, he went to Mount Moriah and studied Torah for, for many years. So she went to inquire of the Lord as we read in the verse, but she didn't, it, it's not, it looks like she went to pray to God and ask God, and of course she did that, but she received her answer through the prophecy of Shem and Eber. And there's a, there's a prophecy here, there are two nations in your womb. Can you say it with me? Two nations in your womb. Two nations in your womb. And it means that rulership will pass from one government to another, meaning that Jacob and Esau would battle constantly. So whenever Jacob ascends, Esau will descend. When Esau ascends, Jacob will descend. And this battle has continued throughout, uh, throughout, world, history, throughout world history. Through the bloodline of Esau came the Roman Empire, came Rome. And Jacob strove for godliness. Esau sought idolatry. He sought evil. He sought wickedness. Even worse than idolatry is that he sought to fulfill every single one of his wicked lusts. Every single one of his wicked lusts. Now I want to read Genesis 25-23 to you from a different translation, from a, from a Jewish translation. And it says this, Through Shem's inspiration, God said to her, the, ins the ancestors of two esteemed individuals are in your womb. Furthermore, two kingdoms will separate from your enemies, one to wickedness and one to innocence. One kingdom will always become mightier than the other kingdom. For when one rises, the other will fall. The elder son will serve the younger. The elder, being Esau, will serve the young, which is Jacob. This is also another teaching in the scripture, and that's regarding our inclinations. Every one of us has two inclinations. We have a Yetzer Hatov, which is the good inclination, and we all have a Yetzer Hara, which is the evil inclination. Thank you, Rabbi. So uh, and we have good, we have good and evil. Uh, and every day, almost every moment, we're confronted with choices. I'm not going to do the good or the evil. And of course, at the moment, the evil seems much better than the good. But the struggle is to choose the good over the evil. Amen. So and the, and the more we feed our evil inclination, that, that means the more we give into it, whether it's gossip or whatever it may be. Guess what? Then that Esau trait will increase in us. But if you continue to bring your evil inclination into subjection to the Holy Spirit through the study of the Word of God, guess what happens? Your evil inclination, your yetzer ha ra, will be subdued, and your yetzer ha tov, your good inclination, will reign. Amen. Now, in the Ethics of the Fathers, it says, who is strong? That's the question they ask. And the response is, he who subdues his personal inclination. So, one who is strong is not one that's mighty with a sword or, or, or with a rifle. One who is strong is one that overcomes his, his character flaws. And that's taken from Ethics of the Fathers, or the Sayings of the Fathers, 4.1. Rabbi Nachman of Breslau said, He who masters his speech will not be overcome. How many of you agree that, over, that controlling your tongue is the most difficult thing in your character? Mm -hmm. Amen. It is mine. And it's the most difficult thing to control. Yes. And James talks about it in, in the scripture. It's like it's like we get with it. It's like it's the heart. It's like the tongue being so small, yet it's so full of wickedness. Yes. Now let's look at Genesis twenty five twenty five. Speaking about Esau, he the first one emerged ruddy. He was completely like a coat of hair, and they named him Esau. And some translations will probably say that he, he emerged red or reddish in color. Esau represents someone that's completely given over to his wicked character flaws. Completely given over. I mean, he, he was, his, the redness means that he was easily angered. Now, anger itself is not good or bad. It's what you, it's what you do with that anger, how you channel that anger that makes it good or bad. That means if you break out, if you break out into a rage, well, guess what? Anger is bad. Mm -hmm. But.
But if you use your anger to fight for the fight for the needs of, of those that can't fight on their own, Amen. that you you stand up to to stand you, you stand up for the, the unborn children, you stand up for righteousness, yes. you stand up for the rights of the elderly, Amen. you stand up for the rights of the widows, you stand up for the rights of the homeless. Amen. Well, guess what? Now you're channeling your anger towards them. Mm -hmm. Amen. So he's, he's reddish in color. Doesn't, the color that he came out doesn't matter. What does matter, what, J, what Moses is showing us, is that he was easily given over anger. And the, and the color red is, is being used to signify that. In Genesis 25, 30, and this is the time where Esau sold the birth, birthright for a pot of beans, is, is how we say it. And um, Genesis 25, 30 says, And Esau said to Jacob, Pour into me some of this red, red pottage, for I am faint. He was therefore named Edom. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, he's basically saying, pour into me now some of that very red stuff. And the word Edom means red, and Edom is a metaphor for cruelty and blood lust. So when Esau came back, and, he, and, 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 that, and Jacob was preparing that, that, um, that porridge, that porridge, I believe it was, it was actually lentils, those lentils were a meal that were prepared after the death of someone. So that was the very day that Abraham had passed away. And Esau had returned after murdering King Nimrod. So that, that's what the Midrash tells us. And Esau could care less about the birthright. He could care less about the transmission of the Torah. He could care less about righteousness. All he cared about was meeting his immediate lust. That's all he cared about, was meeting his immediate need. He, he, I mean, and David, King David, was also born reddish in color. And David was also easily angered. But David, in contrast, channeled his anger towards fighting the battles of God. So if you, if you, if you are easily angered, don't don't feel bad because you're easily angered. Just channel that anger towards serving God. Amen? I don't, I, I don't encourage you to subdue that anger to where you never become angry again. There may be times you need to do that, right? But uh, even more so, channel that anger towards doing God's work. Amen? Amen. Now, Jacob, on the other hand, was... Uh, he spent his time dwelling in tents. He spent his time in, in the tents of, of Shem and Eber. He spent his time in prayer. He spent his time perfecting his character traits. To, to be with God, to become more like God, to serve God fully. Jacob was not a weak one. Jacob was a very strong man. Even when he came to, uh, uh, we read about his life, he was, he, he was extremely strong. He even wrestled all night long with an angel. So Jacob was not a weak man. We often teach about Jacob that he was a weak one, and Esau was strong. And it's quite, quite the contrary. Jacob was very strong. But J Jacob took his evil inclinations and subdued them and submitted fully to God. Now, let's go to Genesis. Let's talk about the birthright. Genesis 25, 27. The boys grew up. Whenever you see grew up, don't think it just means that they, they grew up chronologically. There's something more taking place here. They grew up, it means that their differences became recognizable. Esau was a man who knew how to trap people with his mouth. That's why Isaac became blind. Isaac became blind to the true nature of his elder son, Esau. He was, you know, some would call him a smooth talker. Have you ever been around folks that know when you're around them, they can take any negative situation and spin it to a positive? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and they're so eloquent with their words that wherever they go, everyone falls in love with them. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're just master, they're, they're, they could be master manipulators. They, they, could, they could be, you know, whatever they say, you just fall in love with, with their words. And, <gasps> and they, can, they can change the story from day to day and you just follow right along with them. That is the kind of man Esau was. He was a man of the field. He, he trapped people with his mouth. So don't look at Esau as just that one that, a, a man that went out with a spear or a bow and arrow and killed animals. 
it's not that type of hunting. Even though that type of hunting may have taken place, the hunting was that he trapped people. And he trapped Isaac as well. For example, when Isaac, when, Ish, when Esau would come into Isaac's tent, and Isaac really thought that Esau was really trying to be a good man. Isaac knew that Esau had a lot of challenges and was very easily given over to his wicked ways. But Isaac thought that Esau was really trying. You know, how many of you have, you know, if you had a child or a student or someone that you work with that, that they have a lot of issues and, and, and they, they keep falling back into drugs or whatever it may be, but it looks like they're really trying. Wouldn't you have compassion on, on, on that child? Mm -hmm. Even if that child's not your own, I mean, they're really trying, and and you, you you really go out of your way to help them. Isaac thought Esau was really trying, and I'll give you an example. This is taken from rabbinic commentary. Esau would come to his father Isaac and say, "Father, how do I tithe of the salt?" So he's asking questions of halakha. He's asking questions about Jewish law, the Jewish mitzvot. He's asking, "How do I tithe of the salt?" So Isaac's thinking, wow, my son's really trying. See, that's where the blindness came from, because he thought Isaac, he, Isaac thought Esau was really trying. And so, but to the contrary, Esau was just pull, pull, pulling the, how do you say, putting the wool over his eyes, so Isaac would not see. And Isaac didn't have to spend much time with Jacob, because Jacob had it together already. You know, look at your own kids. Aren't you going to spend, put a bigger effort on those that are struggling than those that have it all together? Mm -hmm. and, and it's natural for parents to do that, but, but guess what takes place? The, the, the child that you think has it all together is going to grow up with a fatherless fashion. Mm -hmm. And that's probably how Jacob felt. Daddy wasn't there for him. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's a Torah that there is, I forget who, there was a, a rabbi or a bitsin that gave a teaching on that, a very powerful teaching on Jacob's fatherless fractures. And I'm sure Abraham had the same thing. Yeah, Abraham was basically fatherless. I mean, there, there, was, there, was, no, there was no relationship between Abraham and his, and, and his father. So Esau used to trap, the way he used to hunt was by trapping people in the woods. Does that make sense? Yes. And just think about the most eloquent person you can think about. And I don't want to. I don't want to bring out any profession. It wouldn't be right to do so, because you can do this in almost any profession. But just think about those that are very smooth with their tongue, very eloquent of speech, and can, and, and very easily trap people in their words. I'm trying very hard not to use the profession. <laughs> so Esau continued his life of. Trapping of trapping people with his words, and Esau became an became an expert in ensnaring his father to think that he was really trying to be a good man, and that's why Isaac wanted wanted to give the blessing to to Esau because he thought Jacob doesn't need it. Jake, Jacob, my son, is already walking with Hashem. He's already walking with the Lord, but. Esau needs an extra blessing to, to be able to become a righteous man. But what Isaac did not discern was Esau was not trying. Esau was given over to wickedness. But I believe God allowed the blindness to come upon Isaac because God wanted Isaac to continue to intercede and to work on Esau. Amen? So I don't believe Isaac's blindness was a flaw on Isaac's part. I believe I, all Isaac wanted to do was to see the good in his son. That's what God wants to do also. You can look in your ministries. You can look in the workplace. There may be those that don't see the, the wickedness of a certain person, and you can see it. You know what? God may have done that intentionally to cause others to intercede for that person. Amen? And it can happen anywhere, in the workplace, in ministry. It can happen in any facet of life. But sometimes... That blindness, God will use that blindness to cause you to, to, to press in and intercede for that child. You, you know, there may be someone that you know that has a child that has this continual battle with, with drugs and alcoholism and just, just can't seem to get out of it. 
and then you, you send them to this place and that place and this group, and, and they, they, get, they, 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 seem to do, they seem to do better for a little while, then they fall right back into the former lifestyle. Well, you know what? God may be calling you to pray harder, to intercede more, to fast more, to consecrate your life more to him, and seek God on that person's behalf. Because a person bound by drugs cannot easily be set free. You know, I, we were told that the uh, cocaine addiction is stronger stronger than even sugar addiction, I, I believe. Mm -hmm. so, and so, and some addictions are so hard to break, and some addictions are generational. Mm -hmm. I've been in places where every single person in the bloodline is an alcoholic, mm -hmm. and every person has died from failed organs due to alcoholism, uh, through excessive drinking. And it, it, it's, it's from the great grandfather, the grandfather, the father, and the son, and the and the grandchildren, it's, it's like, it's, just, it's something that passes to the bloodline, but it's only through prayer that those bondages are broken. Amen. And every one of our bloodlines have different struggles. I don't believe any of us have perfect bloodlines. Yeah. Whether you're in India, whether you're in America, or you're in Europe, or wherever you may be, every one of us has different struggles, but it's only through the word of God that we can overcome these struggles. Amen. Some people get set free in an instant. Some people may just enter into, an, into a holy, anointed atmosphere, and God sets them free in an instant. Other people take years to break bondages. But regardless of how God brings the deliverance, we need to learn how to persevere and not give up and continue to trust God. Amen? Amen. But Esau, so, he, was, he did such a fantastic job of fooling his father. And Esau was completely undisciplined. He had no desire to develop his character. And he spent his time in the field hunting animals, but even more so, he spent his time hunting people and trapping people with his words. Now let's come to the next part of the teaching here. I'm going to try and accelerate the last part. Yitzhak loved Esau. Can you say this with me? Yitzhak, Yitzhak, Yitzhak loved, loved Esau. 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 And Rebecca loved Jacob. Now in, all, in most of your English Bibles, it probably says Isaac loved Esau. And it says, Rebecca loved Jacob, right? Both in the past tense. In the Hebrew translation, it's not worded like that. We have the past tense and the present tense used in the same verse. And it reads like this. Isaac loved Esau in the past tense, but Rebecca loves Jacob in the present tense. So let's examine this here. This is a very interesting part of the study. Isaac loved Esau. So, loved means he, he, he was, he was always, Isaac was always working on Esau to develop him and to cause him to develop and, and improve his character traits. And the word loved in the past tense also represents that Isaac sensed great potential for holiness within Esau. <coughs> and he loved him for it. So he loved it, Esau for what he could have become. Or what he could become because the, the potential was inside of him. Rivka or Rebecca loved Jacob or Jacob in the present tense because he, he was already walking in the full potential that God had for him. Isaac was looking at what Esau could become Rivka was looking at Jacob from what he already was walking, walking in. Mm. Now, almost every teaching I've given on, on Esau completely destroys Esau. Tonight, I'm going to do something I've never done before. I want to bring out the positive side of, of Esau. From Esau's bloodline came some of the greatest prophets in Jewish history. The prophet Obadiah came from the bloodline of Esau. The great sage of the Mishnah, known as Shemaiah, came from uh, and uh, uh, Talion, Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Meir, and Ankelos, who was the author of the Aramaic translation of the Torah. All these men, all these great rabbinic sages, were descendants of Esau. So Isaac sensed great potential within Esau, and he loved him for the great potential that was within, within him. And I mean, imagine two boys growing up in such a holy atmosphere. They both received the same Torah instruction. They both had the most perfect parents, Isaac and Rebecca. But yet, no matter all the good the parents did, it wasn't enough to convert Esau. Because God has given each and every one of us free will. 
But Esau chose the evil. Jacob chose the good. But the good thing is, es Esau did have re redeemable, redeemable qualities, and God blessed that bloodline with some of the greatest sages in, in Judaism today. And Esau, I mean, Isaac worked on Esau. He worked on Esau. And he never gave up on Esau. Even to the point where he told Esau to go out and bring the game and, br and bring the venison to him. He never gave up on Esau. And it wasn't until the time that Jacob came into the tent that Isaac discerned that Esau was not worthy of the Abrahamic covenant. He was not worthy of the blessing. What I'm thinking right now is when Isaac loved Esau, the potential, mm -hmm. it's like when Jacob was giving the blessing over the 12 sons, yes. it was because of the potential. Exactly. That's a very beautiful teaching about Upper Bits in Maryland. In the future, when, when Jacob was elderly, he blessed his 12 sons. And he brought out the potential of each of his very sons. And that's exactly what Isaac was trying to do. He was trying to bring out the potential in Esau. But it wasn't until the time of the blessing that Isaac finally discerned that Esau had no redeemable qualities. Mm -hmm. And he was not worthy of the blessing. Rivka's love for Jacob in the present tense represents a love that's un uninterrupted and is not dependent on his latest or achievements. Loving in the past tense, the way Isaac loved Esau represents, um, I love you because I know greatness is inside of you. I love you because you can do A, B, and C. Now, in our culture, wh whenever somebody asks you, what do you do? How do you respond? You basically re respond with what your career is, what your profession is, right? What do you do? What do you do? What do you do? Th that, that is a secular response to, to because we identify ourselves with our career. And what happens when we lose our career? Well, guess what? We, we, we throw self-esteem out the window because your self-esteem is based upon your career. Well, if, if the career is taken away from you, you have no value, right? Would, would, would you all agree with that? Yes. Something I, 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 I see is true. But that's not the Jewish concept of, of what you are. So if, if you were to ask a Jewish child, what do you want to be when you grow up? If it's, a, if, if it's a male, hopefully he'll say, I want to become a great Zadik. I want to become a righteous person. See, that person is responding, the Jewish child is responding with, I want, I, I want to be known by my character. I want to be a righteous man. I want to be a righteous woman. Amen. I want to be a godly mother, right? Mm -hmm. I want to be, you're not identified by your career, you're identified by your character traits. Amen. And that's what we should all strive for. If you work on character, the, the money will come after you. Don't focus on achieving. I mean, I mean, of course, work on your careers, get your education, do all that stuff that you need to do, but don't let that define you. Amen. Amen? Whether you're a fireman, a, a policeman, a, a doctor, a lawyer, a network engineer, whatever you may be, don't let that define you. What defines you is your character. You know, when we think about Martin Luther King Jr., and he came from a, a, a great bloodline of, of, of preachers, of Baptist preachers. But if I, if I were to ask every one of you, what do you remember about Martin Luther King Jr.? How many, how many of you are going to say, how many of you are going to talk about his profession as a pastor? Probably none of you, right? Maybe a few of you. But you would actually look at, his, at his civil, his, his, the civil rights movement as the highlight of his life. Amen? That's what we remember him for. His selflessness. His speech, I have a dream. And how, and how he brought, how God used him to bring civil rights to, to, to America. And how he was influenced by, by Mahatma Gandhi in, in India. And, and how he strove for, for civil rights. And that's how I want every one of you to see your life. Not to be seen as the wealthiest person in your neighborhood or your city. But to be seen as one that I have, I, I mean, I want my children, my grandchildren, my neighborhood, my family, my friends, my church, my, my circle of influence to see me as a righteous person. As a person that, that did chesed. A person that strove to feed the poor, to take care of the hungry. Amen. I believe when, when the Lord takes Dr. Crow home, 
She will not be, I mean, of course she'll be remembered for her tremendous speeching, her preaching and all the preaching gifts, but I think what she'll be remembered more for is her aunts at Hesed. Amen. I believe it's her Hesed that's going to leave a legacy for generations Amen. to come. Amen. And that, Amen. If Jesus tarries, that's what I believe will, will leave a legacy. The preaching, yes, is probably some of the best preaching and the greatest revelation I've heard in my life. But that won't be her legacy. Her legacy will be her Hesed. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen. So that's what I want you to focus on. Rivka loved Jacob. And I want loves Jacob. So I want you to see your relationship with God as God is always loving you. God does not love you based upon your achievements. God loves you just because you are. Amen? Amen. Yeah. And we, in our Western culture, we focus on results. Mm -hmm. And what we're measured by is by our successes. Mm -hmm. You know what? What's more important than the results is the process. And I believe God honors the process yes. more than the results. Amen. 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 Well, almost done here. I had about 15 pages prepared today. <laughs> <laughs> and I started at 25 this morning. <laughs> I'm telling you, I've been trying to cut down the teachings to 40 minutes, and I'm, I'm struggling. <laughs> I'm really struggling. I want to share every single point with you tonight because Parsha Toldot is my favorite Parsha in the entire Torah. <laughs> so <laughs> in Genesis 27, 21, it says, and I'm going to read this from, from a different translation. When Jacob mentioned God, Yitzhak became suspicious. So Yitzhak said to Yaakov, please come closer so that I may feel you, my son, to see if you are my son Esau, or not. So here's here's Jacob. He obeyed the voice of his mother Rebecca. He prepared the um, the lambs, prepared the meal, brought them into his father's tent. I'm not going to talk to you about the venison and the lamb. There's a lot of teachings in this parsha, but we just don't have time tonight to cover that. I want to focus on one thing. See, Esau <coughs> was self-focused. I would say he's the origin of the selfie generation. So when, when he would walk in, he would, he, would, he would always bring glory to himself. Jacob always had God's voice, uh, God, God on his mind, and God on his tongue. So when, when he came to the tent, he said, he mentioned God. So Isaac becomes suspicious. How can this be Esau? Because Esau never brings glory to God. So already Isaac is suspicious, Go, this is not my son I, this is not my son Esau. This is his twin, Jacob. And then Isaac says, Come closer that I may feel you, my son, to, to, to discern if you are Esau or not. And then Esau, and then Jacob comes near to Isaac, his father, and felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. So Isaac already discerned which son was in front of him. Jacob, being the patriarch of truth, never wanted to, to display any form of deception in his life. For the very first time in his life, Jacob was tested to be to use a little bit of trickery when he went before his father. But if you, when I was looking at the Gutnick translation, or not actually the Rabbi Monk translation of these, of these verses, <coughs> Jacob says very little when he's before his father. He would say like, um, he would say like, I am, period. And then he'd say, Esau is your firstborn. So he's very careful with his words that he did not lie when he went before his father. Of course, when you look at your, your English translations, it doesn't look like that. And even the title in my Bible here is, uh, you know, this is just what the, uh, the translators put in this area, this section is titled, Jacob Steals Isaac's Blessing. Jacob did not steal it. God gave it to him. So, Isaac, already, at this very moment, because he says the voice is Jacob's and the hands are Esau, he discerns right away that the man in front of him was Jacob. And he discerned right away that Esau used wicked schemes or force to obtain his desire. He discerned, he, 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 he became fully aware of Esau's wickedness. 
Now, Rebecca was already fully aware of Esau's wickedness. Do you know how Rebecca knew? She learned from the time she went to the tent of Shem and Ephraim. And she received the prophetic word that the elder would serve the younger. She already knew that Esau had no redeem, redeemable qualities. Of course, some of his descendants had redeem, redeemable qualities, but Esau himself had no redeemable qualities. But Rebecca, being such a righteous woman, never spoke evil about her son Esau to her husband. Can you imagine carrying a prophecy for 40 years and not telling your husband about the prophecy? That is exactly the type of woman Rebecca was. She never spoke evil about her son Esau, even though she knew how wicked he was, and she knew that he was about to receive the blessing. She never spoke a single evil word about her son Esau. But she did obey the prophetic word. When it came time for the blessing, she, she, she knew about the Spirit of God, and she instructed Jacob on what he was to do, and that was the leading of the Holy Spirit. So, I, so Jacob did not use trickery to get the blessing. It was God's plan to give him the blessing. And the only person that was tricked in this whole thing was Esau. So Isaac discerned that that's, this is when Isaac finally became aware of the wickedness of his elder son, Esau. Then in verse 27, Yaakov or Jacob came closer and he kissed him. Then Yitzhak smelled the fragrance of what he thought was his garments, and he blessed him, and he said, Look, the fragrance of my son is like the fragrance of the field of apples, which God has blessed. What took place here when the, bless when the blessing was about to be given, Isaac smelled the smell of the Garden of Eden. He, bathed, he came under the anointing of the Spirit of God, and the very same fragrance that was in the Garden of Eden was now present within his tent. And that was the very scent that was present when, I, when Isaac was about to be offered at Mount Moriah. And he knew, he, he, knew, he knew that Jacob was to be the recipient of the Abrahamic covenant. And the generations passed on from Isaac to Jacob, not to, not to, not to Esau. And then the blessing is given. Verse 28. Then God, he's, I'm sorry, he says, Therefore God give you of the dew of heaven, of the fatness of the earth, and plenty of corn and wine. Let people serve you, nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren, and let thy mother's son bow down to you. Cursed be everyone that curses you, and blessed be he that blesses you. Doesn't it sound like the blessings that Jesus gave his disciples? Mm -hmm. Now the very first thing that <coughs> took place here is a reparation taking place. Now, I'm not going to share all of this with you, but, but I, I will post this on the blog site tonight or tomorrow. Is the serpent came in cunning in the garden and used trickery to cause Eve to partake of the fruit. And then she gave that fruit to, to her husband. So sin came into the world through trickery. Now, God used trickery to counteract what the serpent had brought in. So what took place in Isaac what took place in Isaac's tent was a reparation for the sin that took place in the garden. So all the, the curse comes into the ground. Well guess what? Here the curse is being reversed. There's a reparation taking place. The dew of heaven. And may God give you the dew of the heavens. That was a reply to the curse of on Adam. Through <clears throat> suffering shall you eat of it. The fatness of the earth surplants the word the curse of is the ground because of you. Plenty of corn and wine annuls the curse of thorns and thistles shall it sprout to you from Genesis 3.18. Peoples will, peoples will serve you, abolishes the verdict. By the sweat of your brow shall you eat bread from Genesis 3.19. So we see the curse going into remission. We see the curse that was brought about in Genesis Chapter 3 is now being reversed in, in, in Genesis 27. So Esau, who was the trickster, has now been tricked. We see the same thing with Amalek. Amalek was hung on his own gallows. Not hung, yeah. yeah. It was hung on his own gallows. 
And then Satan, who thought he was bringing an end to Messiah by having him crucified, had no idea that, that that's what God was using to bring redemption to the entire world. So the serpent comes in cunningly, cunningly, but guess what? God comes in even more cunningly. Amen? Amen. So the laugh is, on, is upon Han, which we'll learn about when we come to the, the time of uh, Purim. And tonight, Lord God, I'm going to ask you all to stand with me. Lord, tonight, I ask you to reverse every bond upon the life of people. Lord, tonight, I ask that bondage is going to be broken, whether drug addiction, maybe relational problems, whatever the, whatever the challenges are, Lord God, Lord, I'm asking you, Lord God, to bring reparation. And Lord, I pray that reversals will take place, Lord God. And Lord, I pray the blessings of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov will fall upon your people here, Lord God. And that through the blood of Yeshua, through the blood of Jesus, Lord God, that we will receive the reparation, Lord God. The, and Lord, I thank you tonight, Lord God, for teaching us your holy Torah, Lord God, and to teaching us that Jacob was truly worthy of the blessing. He was truly a man of truth. And that, Lord, you chose Jacob to pass on the Abrahamic covenant. And Lord, we give you all the praise, all the honor. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise. Amen.